This week on football, Jordan Henderson leads the press. Tara Kirk scores her 7 millionth goal. 39-year-old Barry Fuller with an old-fashioned tackle. Paul Turney makes a monumental error. Well, of course, the referee's made a monumental error. I think you'll know that this morning he's made a, made a mistake and, and hopefully he can rectify in the future. Trim of the week spotted amongst the Liverpool fans. And watch here as an injured player is dragged on and off and off and on and off a pitch in Brazil. Hello, welcome to this week's episode of Goalpost for Jumpers. It is me, your host, Alex, and coming up in this week's episode, we've got no two lies and a truth. We have, however, got England's best 11. We'll be discussing England's best starting 11 instead. Um, we've had a few submissions, so I did a little uh, post on Instagram, see which of you wanted to get involved and maybe start a debate on the show for this week's episode so we've got a few suggestions coming up we have got a cracking fan captured goal of the week at the end of the show so make sure you stick with us and uh, I've got my weekend treble and my team of the week coming up as well Uh, but first let's start with what people asked us to talk about on Instagram There's a few things that I was going to cover anyway, so I've left those out. Um, The first one I got was England's best start in 11. I was going to do that anyway this week, funnily enough. So I've left that to the end. Um, So make sure you stick with us again for that because we'll be doing that a little bit later. I got a question that was, why are Man United so... Uh, Good question. Man United are awful because we have a manager who doesn't make any changes in play that positively impact our football team. He also doesn't set up with a midfield and we've got players who can't be asked or actually aren't good enough. So there, hopefully that answers your question. Uh, Best looking host. I'll leave that to bootlegger to answer. Gareth, you're a Welshman. Can I shake your hand? Obviously. And I absolutely love you. I love you too, bro. But I would find Alex more attractive than you. Oh. No, it's fine. I, I take that on board. I'll take that. that. And, you know. Best reaction to fans chants live. I didn't know what that meant. So here's the context. This was submitted by a, a listener of the show, Joe. Uh, have a look. Is Kelleher better than Allison? That is a great question. No, he's not. Allison is a top goalkeeper. Uh, Kelleher is a great number two, but I don't think there's any comparison between the two, to be honest. Allison's the number one for Liverpool when he's fit, and Kelleher's a great step in. Although I have praised Kelleher recently and criticised Alisson, it doesn't mean when you criticise a player that you automatically have to say they are the worst player ever. They can still be a great player, but have faults in their game that's not been addressed by the media or fans or glossed over, particularly by pundits. So that's my point on Alisson. 
Uh, are you ready to admit you were wrong about Nunes? No, because I never said Nunes is a great player, nor did I say he's a terrible player. I said, I don't know which one he is because he comes up with moments of brilliance, but then also some absolutely ridiculous moments that make you wonder how he's ever made it as a professional footballer. At the moment, Nunes is having a good season. Nothing better, nothing worse. He's having a good season. Uh, So no, I'm not wrong about Nunes. I stick by what I said, that he's just a very conflicting player. Um, Shall we talk about the derby? Uh, Right, so we can talk about the derby if you want. The Manchester derby, that is. A pretty shocking day for Man United fans. A pretty great day for City fans. And a pretty bad day for Liverpool fans. For the most part, Liverpool obviously love seeing Man United get beat. They were all cheering us on this weekend. It was creepy. It was weird. I didn't like it. Uh, Yeah, please don't anymore. Or they won't. That's it. But City, the better team, the better players, the better manager, the better tactically Everything about City is better than Manchester United at the moment. And it's. I think the saddest thing about it is going 1-0 up, going into half time, and knowing you're still going to get beat by your rivals. There was never a doubt in anyone's mind that you know City goal was coming. The way it came with the Foden goal, I will say, I think a lot of people were ready then to jump on United. It's the first time, and I think Gary Neville said it as well, it's the first time I've seen United set up in a way that makes sense against a big side. Low block, sat deep, man-for-man marking, trying to counter with the likes of Rashford and the pace of Garnacho. Unfortunately, we weren't clinical in the few, very few moments that we had, and City were clinical in their moments, obviously the Haaland chance aside. But... Foden goal goes in. I think it's one of those goals where you just got to go, do you know what? That's unbelievable. That is unbelievable for him in the same way that Rashford's goal was fantastic. The second goal and the third goal, the reason why that's frustrating for United fans is that A, that it was coming and B, that you could see it a mile off and C, that it's so typical of Man United to concede in that fashion once we're under a bit of pressure, we score or we concede and then we capitulate and it happens time after time under this manager with these players. At the biggest moments, we crumble and they just fold. And look, City will put those that amount of pressure on you. It's it's inevitable. But to go into that 90 minutes and not expect that or not be prepared for it. I thought Johnny Evans, Varane and Dallo had good games. Anana had a good game. But we are so weak on that left-hand side with Victor Lindelof. And it was something that Ten Hag didn't address for an hour of the game, even though that was the most... I thought that was the area that needed addressing the most. He left Dallo out on the right. He left Lindelof out on the left. And then, obviously, we concede the second. He makes the changes. Johnny Evans goes off and Dallo switches to left-back, which Foden really didn't get much of a kick after that point. But then he moved over to the left-hand side and then got in through there with a quick one too. Look. It's a game that we knew we were going to lose. It's a game that City fans knew they were probably going to win. The most disappointing is the lack of fight after after the 2-1 and the 3-1. Like even even with 10 minutes to go, just keep running, keep going, put a tackle in. And that's one of the few times you want to see maybe someone going a little bit hard, get the fans up, put a little bit of pressure on City, maybe change the mentality of their players. And then go again. Look, you never know. With 10 minutes to go, anything can happen in football. But just, yeah, it was just absolute a nothing 20 minutes. They should have they should have just blown the whistle after Phil Foden's second goal to take the league because that was it then. And City are very good at that. So, yeah, you've got to hold your hands up. Um, very good. But Manchester United, very disappointing. Uh, let's do my team of the week. Team of the week is the part of the show where I give you my team of the week sounds obvious but I only include players that I have seen play live or have watched the full 90 minutes no one that I haven't seen play the full 90 it's a good rule to go by because it just means that I'm not putting random players into fill positions just because match of the day pundits said they were good I've actually got to pick one that I think is good so starting off in goal I went with Andre Onana right back Wilfred Singo center back Matthew Pearson Alongside him is Tom Lees. Left back is Milos Kerkes. 
Central midfield, Rodri. Central midfield alongside him is also Lewis Cook. And then finishing off that midfield three is Callum Neuenhoff. Right wing is Phil Foden. Left wing is Kavica Kravatskelia. And the striker, central striker, has to be Ollie Watkins. Uh, just a couple of points on these players. First of all, the centre-back partnership of Tom Lees and Matty Pearson. Those two for uh, probably the full 90, to be fair, after John Hogg got sent off, were brilliant against a really strong lead side. I was really impressed with the pair of them. I thought they were the best centre-back partnership that I've seen this weekend, so they had to go in there. Onana, I mentioned earlier, I thought he had a great game against City. Not much he could have done for the first goal the third goal maybe the second but they slowed it down it was a quick finish and a sharp finish from Foden but I thought overall did really well uh, and Lewis Cook two assists this week a, f- a few there's a few names that some of you who maybe don't watch all other than Premier League football you wouldn't recognize uh, Callum Neuerhoff went to Hearts after being in the A-League I liked him in the A-League and he's one of those players where I watch the Australian league because I'm sad. But I was like, oh, he could. I think he could do a, a job in the championship or something. A lot of Scottish teams take a risk on the A League players. And Neuenhoff is, I think he's 23 years old. I thought he was a great signing. Did really well for Hearts against uh, Celtic and obviously beat Celtic 2 0, which is a fantastic result for them. So I thought he had to go in there. Uh, we will touch briefly on the Kvaric Skelia. One, I know I've said in the past that he's overrated. He's still a great player. He's just not on the same level as the best left wingers and right wingers in the world. But what he showed in that Juventus game, he definitely, definitely is pushing his way up there because what I wanted out of him was not just one great season. I wanted to see two seasons, three seasons at that level. And then we can talk about him in that bracket. But he had a really slow start to the season. He's starting to find form now similar to how he how he found form last season. And the goal that he scored was fantastic. All game, just an absolute nightmare to defend against. He would be horrible. I think he'd be great in the Premier League, by the way, if anyone is looking for a left winger. And I think a few teams could do with someone like that. He's almost like a Jack Grealish, but w- without taking that directness out of him, which Pep Guardia Guardiola has done with Jack Grealish the only thing is if he's the sort of player that goes to a Premier League side does he go to Man City and then do they just absolutely kill him like they've done with Jack Grealish I hope he doesn't I want him to go to someone you know that plays exciting football and Napoli do do that they play you know a lot of attacking direct football and I think that's what suits him Um, controversial opinion but hear me out I've put Rodri in this team of the week but isn't Rodri just the most boring footballer on the planet? He never loses the ball. He always makes the right pass, never takes wild shots. Everything he does is so considered and so perfect. It's so boring. And I've said this for a while. He's anti-football. He's the sort of player that I'm like, I watch him. I was like, it's boring when you're that good. And I said... I think I've always said, to, my opinion has always been that Sergio Busquets is the best central defensive midfielder I've ever seen in my life. I think Rodri might be better, but it's boring. I, it, I don't know how to explain it. Football isn't about perfection. It's about imperfection. The beauty of football is in the imperfection. It's in the enigmatic, the dynamic players, the people who get you off your seat. Rodri doesn't do that. Rodri is just a great footballer and a perfect footballer and never does anything wrong. And that, for me, is just so boring. Uh, It's probably symptomatic of Man City and Pep Guardiola that it is quite boring to watch them at times. But Rodri, he's the best defensive midfielder I have ever seen in my life. But alongside that, he's the most boring footballer I've ever seen in my life. And I can't stand him. I can't stand him. I've put him in there because he was unbelievable against Man United, as you'd expect. But I'm just so sick of watching him. Never, He never gets yellow carded. He always does. Like I said, he always, he's so perfect. He's always right on the line of making professional fouls that don't see him get booked. 
So he passes perfectly. He shoots perfectly. He makes everything look easy. He makes the right decision every single time. Never gets penalised for his professional fouls and scores winners in a Champions League final. Grow up. It's like, do you know what? It's like, it's almost like Haaland. Like Haaland's just perfect. Like Football's not about that. It's about, I like the, I like the players that just, I like Anthony. Fuck you. Uh, another player that I do like um, and had to be my striker this week, Ollie Watkins. Is Ollie Watkins the best striker that Aston Villa have ever had? Because I was looking at some of the figures and he's like fifth or sixth or something like that on the all-time goal scorers list. But number one is Gabby Agbon Lahore. Granted, Agbon Lahore spent his whole career there uh, and Ollie Watkins has only been maybe four seasons. But I think Ollie Watkins is the best striker that Aston Villa have ever had and will have for quite some time. This is a point now where we assess Ollie Watkins for the Euro squad. He's never, he's not going to sh- start for England. Harry Kane's always going to get that spot. But if he's this sharp going into the summer and Harry Kane isn't 100%, say he picks up an injury or something like that, what a player to bring in. I'm having Tony and Watkins and Kane as my three strikers. But Ollie Watkins, is there, is there a shout for him to play left wing? Or is there a shout... Maybe the Southgate can kind of configure it where he plays two strikers or Ollie Watkins as a central striker. Do you know when someone's just playing that well, you've got to fit him in your side somehow. Ollie Watkins is that player. Um, yeah, he's just, he's so sharp. And I th- he's got the most goal involvement in the league right now, which is mental. He's quick, strong. He's got an unbelievable first touch. When I first saw him, really saw him, was playing for Brentford. And when he was playing for Brentford, the first thing that struck me about Ollie Watkins wasn't scoring goals. I think he grabbed 20, 30 goals for Brentford that season. But it was his hold-up play, his retention of the ball and his pressing. And I thought when I watched him, I was like, that is a Premier League striker, that. Because, yes, he scores the goals, but when it's not going for him and he's not scoring a goal, can he do all the hard work, all the stuff that you don't want to do, but as a striker is so influential for your team, presses like nobody else, retains the ball, the ball sticks to him, great first touch, he's an instinctive finisher, great in the air, which is crazy for a player to be so complete. He's also lightning quick, so he's got that on his side, great mentality, the the question will be with Ollie Watkins now, can he make that step up for England on the big stage? Can he do it in the biggest games? It'll be interesting seeing Villa if they progress a little bit further into, into Europe this season. And look, Emery's got a great run and great track record for for European competitions. But can Ollie Watkins then really take that ball by the horns in the latter stages of that tournament and take Villa to a trophy? a bit like Jared Bowen did last year for West Ham. I think this is a big season for Ollie Watkins to show, yes, he can do it against Luton. Yes, he can do it against Sheffield United. Can he now do it on the biggest stage in the biggest games and prove that he has, you know, I think a fair shout to start for England, even if it's left wing, even if it's out of position, even if it's a second striker to Kane, do we change a formation around a player that is so in form? It's hard to leave out. I think... Maybe, um, but we'll see. On that topic of fitting a player in to an England side that's playing so well, you can't ignore him. Where do we fit Phil Foden in this England side? That is a question that I feel like people are missing the point on and it's staring us right in the face. We are crying out for that third midfielder. Bellingham, Rice, guaranteed. That third midfielder is an open spot. People are talking about 18-year-olds like Kobe Mainu. Fair shout. There's also talks of Jordan Henderson. There's also talks of Calvin Phillips. And we hope we don't see those players. Then there's Trent Alexander-Arnold. And I don't think any of those players do what Phil Foden can do. Trent is a different type of player. Brilliant on the ball, facing goal, and has got great delivery, great passing range. 
But what Phil Foden can do in tight spaces on the half turn, receiving the ball, not just that, when it's really sticky in those horrible situations, you're getting pressed. International football is going to be like that against the best sides. Can you have a player in that midfield that can navigate and worm his way out? He has got that technical ability, that low centre of gravity, the ability to dribble in tight spaces. And he also can make a pass and he can get forward and score as he's showing at the moment. Foden in that third midfielder spot. As a 10 is where I would put him. Bellingham in the eight. I've seen a lot of people complain, you can't take Bellingham, the best number 10 in the world, out of that number 10 spot. I don't think England need Bellingham in a 10 as much as we need Foden in a third midfield position. Bellingham in an eight is still good enough to win England a tournament. Our goals don't have to come from him. Yes, he is a scorer of goals, but Phil Foden can be that as a third centre midfielder. Jude Bellingham can still get forward in that role and get back because he's brilliant defensively and brilliant at progressing play. But our goals always have and always will come from our main striker, particularly in international tournaments. It's going to be Harry Kane who's going to grab those goals. They're not typically going to be high scoring games when you see the likes of Italy's and France and Portugal. They'll probably be really tight games and you need someone to get on the end of one. Harry Kane's that guy. I want Jude Bellingham getting back and forward because he is that good. I think he's the player that is going to lead England to winning a trophy and their first trophy in 50 years. 60 years going on. And I don't think wasting Phil Foden on the bench or out left where he doesn't want to play. Bear in mind, Phil Foden has made it pretty clear he wants to play centrally. He likes playing centrally. I've seen people talk about Foden preferring that left wing position. I've never heard that. I've heard him say he likes it centrally. And yes, he was out right against Man United on the weekend and he scored his goals from right and left. But if he can operate with that freedom centrally, which I think Southgate can do and afford to do with Rice and Bellingham sitting and Bellingham getting forward and back, why not? Both those players, Rice and Bellingham, have got the legs to cover. Foden, it's not like he doesn't track back either. Saka out on the right. Rashford out on the left. There's your team. And that team, I think, wins a tournament. I don't think we need Bellingham in the 10. That's my opinion. Uh, let us know what you think and we'll put the video up and I'm sure we'll get loads of stick. We have done this week. I can't believe the amount of stick that I got this week, by the way, for saying that <laughs> Moises Caicedo is not a good transfer. Like, he is a massive waste of money. He cost £150 million. Pound. i got Chelsea fans piping up saying, you don't watch football, you don't ever watch Chelsea, how can you have that opinion? I watch Chelsea. He's not £150 million pounds worth of footballer. And also, I called out Mudrick, who also isn't a £90 million pound footballer. But apparently, no, give him time and all this. Yet, on the other hand, I'm an idiot for saying Anthony needs a chance. I don't get it. Madness. Um, on that England uh, topic, though, I said earlier that I was going to do England's best start in 11. And I think you kind of gauged from where I'd put Foden, how you'd have, you know, the front three and the middle three. But let's do the full team from start to finish, from goalkeeper to striker. In goal, uh, Pickford. Jordan Pickford is the guaranteed spot in this England side. He is our best goalkeeper. He's great with his feet always delivers in a big tournament, has to go in there. Uh, right back, Carl Walker, best right back in world football, best right back on the planet. There's no chance I'm having anyone else over Carl Walker in that back four. Uh, John Stones, our best centre-back, one of the best centre-backs in the world at the moment, great on the ball, brilliant defensively, great mentality, winning mentality. I think he's an absolute must and if he gets injured, I think England are in trouble. Maguire, I am 70% sure that Harry Maguire fills that second centre-back spot. I'm not absolutely sold on it, but Maguire at tournaments seems to do the job. And I actually think he's had an all right season for United in the last sort of three months. I think he's been pretty good. Barring any injuries, I think Harry Maguire will be that second centre-back anyway. Uh, Luke Shaw at left-back. If we don't have Luke Shaw fit, for the tournament. I will be gutted because he is a fantastic left back and England's best left back. But if we don't, I think Kieran Trippier can slot into that. And 
I think he's a trusted fullback, whether he's right or left, and adds a little bit more in the sense that he's got the dead ball situations, great from a free kick, great from a corner, uh, and can deliver the ball. So yeah, I think that's okay. Luke Shaw is my first choice left back though. Uh, Central midfield, Declan Rice, best transfer of the season, by the way, the best transfer of the season. If Arsenal go on to win the title, it's because of Declan Rice. And I think, yeah, absolute monster midfielder has to be in there. Alongside him, our best player, Jude Bellingham, the man on form, arguably the best player in the world right now. If this man is fit and firing, England will be unstoppable in the tournament. And it's so weird to say that because I've never felt like that going into a tournament, looking at our players thinking the mentality is right, that we can win something. Jude Bellingham is a winner. And I love his mentality. He's win at all costs. And I think that's what England need. I'm playing him in the eight. I'm playing Phil Foden in that third midfield position because you have to fit him in. And I think that is his best position. Taking the ball on the half turn, progressing play, turning, dribbling out of tight spots. He'll get on the end of things. He'll create things, but he also work back as well. And I think him and Bellingham going forward is a nightmare for any team. On the left wing... I'm not 100% sold on it, but I'm pretty much there. Marcus Rashford, yes, he's having a shocking season. Yes, he doesn't track back and he is extremely frustrating. But in the biggest moments, Rashford turns up and I think that's where we're going to need him. He will frustrate England fans like in the same way that he's frustrating Man United fans at the moment. But I think in those one-off games... There's not a better left, left winger in, in in England for me. And I think he's got to have that spot. If I don't see any improvement and Rashford stays at this level until the tournament, throwing his arms up, not tracking back, having this attitude, I would be open to Anthony Gordon on that left wing position because I think he has been probably the best left winger in the league this season. Is that right? Yeah, I think he probably is, isn't he? Son's playing through the middle now. I think Anthony, Anthony Gordon probably is the best left winger in the league at the moment. So yeah, I think he has an outside chance if Rashford doesn't up his game. On the right wing, Bakayo Saka, absolute no-brainer. Anyone who thinks any different, you're mental. Some people are talking about Phil Foden going out right wing. Why waste a fantastic right winger on a player playing out of position or not in his best position or in a position that he doesn't have to play. So yeah, Saka has to be their most consistent winger in the league. And striker is Harry Kane. Yeah, world-class. And to have a world-class player in the team is important. I think we've got Walker, Stones, Rice, Bellingham, Foden, Kane and Saka, all world-class players. This is England's chance. It's our best chance. A lot of people will put it on Gareth Southgate if we don't win a tournament. Can I just remind you that some of the most golden generations do not win tournaments and it's not because they are failures or they were bottlers. It's because international football has one trophy every two years. It is not as easy as just winning it. It's not always the best team that wins a tournament. It's not always the best manager that wins a tournament. And you just have to look at Champions League. Man City have been the best team probably in the world for the last five, six years. And they've just won their first trophy under the best manager of our generation. So not the best manager always winning a tournament. Not the best team always winning a tournament. Sometimes it takes a little bit more than that. Sometimes it takes luck. You look at the tournament from last uh, year, the World Cup, and the only thing really that I think stopped England from winning that tournament was the most corrupt officiating I've ever seen in my life. And I've never seen anything like it since. That refereeing performance cost England a place in the next round. And I think if we'd have beaten France, we'd have gone on that Argentina would have been a difficult proposition in the final with Messi and everything. But I thought we were the best team in that tournament until that point. So it's not always going to be down to the manager and it's not always going to be down to the players. I think this is the first time where I felt the players are up for it. The manager uh, is up for it and the and not just that, the quality's there. So yeah, I really fancy us for, for the Euros and not jinxing it. And I don't even care if I jinx it. It is what it is. That's my opinion. 
Uh, let's do the weekend treble. Last week's treble missed by one goal. We went a little bit risky last week. We did, it was a five to one shot. We normally do about threes. Um, it did miss. We are we were nineteen pounds up, so we could afford to take a little bit of a risk. We're a little bit more conservative this week. We only missed by one goal last week, which is ridiculous. But these uh, selections for this week are Sassolo versus Frosinone over two and a half goals. The second selection is Charlton to beat Carlisle, and the third one is Watford versus Coventry. Both teams to score ten pound on returns thirty six pounds and thirty two pence. Back it, keep it responsible, and follow the progress. We're uh, we're in profit at the moment. We're nine pounds up, so we can afford a couple of risky ones this week. Like I said, gone a little bit more conservative, and let's hope it comes in. Right, I promise you a fan captured goal of the week, and this week's a corker. And actually, do you know what? This week I couldn't do one without doing the other, so we've got two. This one comes in from Stretty End. It's Rashford's absolute thunderbolt against Manchester City in the derby. And the other one, the same guys caught the other one from the same end. Um, like I said, couldn't include Rashford's one without including Phil Foden's wonder strike in the Manchester derby. Two unbelievable strikes and amazing that he's caught it on, on camera. And actually his page, it's at Stretty End, if you're a United fan or just a fan of football, he captures some absolute belting moments. So yeah, it's always good to see from a fan's point of view. Uh, right, guys, please, if you haven't already subscribed, we are growing ever so slowly. We've got probably since the start of the season, we've got four, 400 new subs on YouTube. That doesn't convert to views. YouTube always copyrights every single bit of our content. So you actually have to put your alerts on to know that we've posted a video. Hence why nobody ever watches our videos and everyone always listens instead. So if you haven't already, subscribe. If you're listening, please go to our YouTube channel, hit subscribe. And if you hit that notification button, you'll get a notification when we've posted our most recent episode. So please do that. Um, big shout out to a few people for this week as well. Thank you for Daniel Stevens for all of your hard work in reposting our videos. Thank you to Greg Parry. You have pretty much liked every single one of our videos that we've posted on TikTok so far. Thank you to Dave Whedon, legend, absolutely great guy and listens to our podcast every week and you if you're keen viewers you'll see his head is the one that pops up every now and then i've got to include a little dave head every now and then guys thank you so much for tuning in once again we'll be back next week every wednesday until the end of the season thanks for joining have a great week Cherish these days, be